Let me first of all commend uh, Mr. Shogbola and his team, Emilia, whom I've been liaising with since I left Lagos. I forget which day I am today. Today is, today is Friday, right? Saturday. Oh, I left Lagos on th Thursday night. I arrived. Okay. So I'm with you. Um, we don't have Chief Obasanjo here today. But I must say that when I saw the flyer that he was going to be attending, gracing this event, I really gave kudos to the organizers because to have President Obasanjo endorse an event such as this is really, really, really a statement of intent. So I commend you for that, Mr. Shukbola. Now, I'm going to be speaking to you about investing in Nigeria from the diaspora, the challenges and opportunities that that presents. Are the slides there? I won't be able to do that. Maybe if you could just help me speak a little. I feel very honored to have been invited by the Nigerian American Business Forum to speak on the vast and exciting opportunities existing and evolving in one of the most viable investment destinations in Africa, and indeed the world today, Nigeria. I know we, most of us here, are already aware of the country profile, but I know that there are some of you that haven't been back home for quite a while and are not aware of the present profile of the country, so I'll just go speak a little bit about that. Although classified as a lower middle income country, Nigeria is the largest economy in Africa and the 27th largest economy in the world, with an estimated GDP of $405 billion in 2016. This is despite having been in its worst recession in decades through the 2016 fiscal year. With the return to normalization, GDP growth is estimated at about 1% for 2017, despite having taken its steepest currency devaluation in recent history within the year. As at September 2017, the nation's external debt stood at $15.4 billion, representing just 3.8% of GDP, while external reserves have recovered to 40.4 billion as of December 2017. Notably, inflationary pressures have also steadily declined from 18.72% at the beginning of the year to 15.37 in, in December 2017. As we're all aware, Nigeria is a resource-rich economy, possessing the second largest oil reserves in Africa and the 10th largest in the world. Other notable minerals include coal, bitumen, and precious metals, while major commodities produced are agriculture, timber, and rubber. Importantly, although often regarded as an oil-dependent economy, oil and gas contributes only about 6% to Nigeria's GDP. Services and agriculture are the two largest contributors to GDP, with a combined aggregate of 86%. Other sectors contributing to the GDP include manufacturing and mining. Nigeria is also rich in human resources, as has been mentioned all through today's sessions, accounting for 47% of West Africa's population, with a population of about 184 million in inhabitants and boasts of one of the largest youthful populations in the world. So against this familiar background, what is the economic outlook currently? In September 2017, the Bureau of Statistics announced 0.55% growth on GDP for Q2 2017, which officially indicated the emergence of the economy from recession. After five consecutive quarters of contraction since quarter one 2016, the return to economic growth has been fueled by the continued oil recovery, sustained growth in agriculture, 
and foreign exchange liquidity improvements, which continues to facilitate increased investments and private sector activity. Against the backdrop of the modest recovery in 2017, economic outlook remains positive, with expectations of further strengthened growth estimates of 2.5% for 2018, followed by 2.8% 2 in 2019, and 2020 as estimated by the World Bank in its January 2018 Global Economic Prospect Report. The African Development Bank also estimates growth at 2.1% for 2018 and 2.5% 2 for 2019. These revised growth forecasts are predicated on higher crude oil prices. I believe crude oil is trading today at about $70 per barrel. Uh, in 2016-15, we were trading at about $40, $40 per barrel. I believe the budget, 2016 budget was predicated on about $45 per barrel. Recovery in oil production, stronger agricultural performance, and importantly, growth in other non-oil sectors. Despite long-standing power outages, bouts of insecurity, and revenue mobilization challenges, the African Development Bank opines that implementation of the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan, which focuses on six priority sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, solid minerals, services, including information and communication technology, financial services, tourism, and creative industries, construction and real estate and oil and gas, hold the promise of weaning the country off its dependence on oil for foreign exchange earnings. Indeed, all economic indicators point to the fact that the ERGP has played a significant part in helping the economy emerge from recession, with GDP showing a marginal growth of 0.72%. By the third quarter of 2017, the growth level doubled to 1.40%, with strong showing in agriculture, which grew by 3.06%. The reality is that notwithstanding the challenges posed by oil prices and production levels, the upward trends in GDP contributions of the telecoms, real estate, manufacturing, construction, and entertainment industries over the last decade births an increasingly resilient and diversified economy. In a 2014 report, McKinsey and Co. states that Nigeria has the potential to achieve 7.1% annual GDP growth, which could make Nigeria a top 20 economy by 2030, with GDP in excess of $1.6 trillion. Nigeria could have 160 million people in the consuming class households, representing more consumers than the current populations of France and Germany combined, as well as prospects for 120 million Nigerians to move about the empowerment line and for 70 million to move out of poverty. But I'm sure we're all familiar with the promise of Nigeria and the infrastructure, governance, security, and business environment challenges that have held the country back over the years. There is a saying, though, that you should never let a good crisis go to waste. I believe Nigeria has imbibed this philosophy, and I opine that one of the indicators of this is the focus on ease of doing business and the initiatives by the present administration in this regard. Even though the Nigerian government set itself the target of moving 20 places up the World Bank ease of doing business rankings by the end of 2017, it actually surpassed that target as the 2017 report issued in October last year showed that Nigeria has moved up 24 places to 145 from the 2016 placement of 169. The World Bank also recognized Nigeria as one of the top 10 reforming countries in the world. I also believe that as entrepreneurs, investors, and nationals, we should also seize the opportunity in the prevailing development gaps in the country. See the glass half full rather than half empty. 
Let me just say a few words about the Nigerian investment opportunity. So what are those investment opportunities? I'll attempt to highlight a few of these, starting with the very popular infrastructure, infrastructure needs. Nigeria's infrastructural needs. The first is power. On the ease of obtaining electricity for business, Nigeria ranked 172nd of 190 countries. Up to 100 million Nigerians, 100 million Nigerians, that is 55% of the approximately 182 million Nigerians have absolutely no access to grid electricity. Despite a target of 40,000 megawatts by 2020, current peak generations stands at 4,000, a dismal 4,350 megawatts. The six Jenkos only have available capacity of 7,000 megawatts after an installed capacity of 10,396 megawatts. In response, many independent power projects have sprung up but the gap remains in excess of 60% of the requirement. Telecommunications. Following the deregulation of the telecommunications sector in 2001, the sector is no doubt one of the shining stars and fastest growing in Nigeria. You would have heard in the news recently, I think yesterday, that uh, Nine Mobile has now been acquired by Teleology for $500 million. So that keeps the business going. It was in distress, but that, that uh, auction was successful. And Teleology has acquired Nine Mobile, which was formerly Etisalat. Now, with over 141 million subscribers, 101.7% teledensity, 94.8 million internet subscribers, Active mobile broadband penetration is still at just 21%. Transport. Road transport in Nigeria accounts for 90% of all freight and passenger movement. 78% of national road network is in poor condition. It is estimated that about $10.2 billion is needed annually to finance Nigeria's transport needs. Housing, an estimated $56 trillion is needed to address a deficit of about 17 million housing units. Mortgage finance as a percentage of GDP equates to just about 0.5%. Home ownership rate is less than 25%, and the country ranks 179 out of 190 countries on ease of registering a property. <laughs> but significant growth has been taking place in the sector across both residential and commercial real estate segments. So one theme cutting across and driving the infrastructural developments in Nigeria has been public-private partnerships. So leveraging cap private capital for infrastructure financing. I'll mention a few Nigerian case studies where that has been successful. Um, the Leki Expressway Toll Road. This is Nigeria's first ever PPP project and it comprises the rehabilitation and upgrade of 40, 49 kilometers of a two lane dual carriageway to a three lane highway. The introduction of three tall plazas and the construction of a, 20, a new 20 kilometer highway along the south coast of the Ekbe Peninsula. You also have the Eco Atlantic project development, which is, for those of you who don't know the Eco Atlantic project, this is uh, what is termed as the Dubai of Africa. The, the, the project is an entire new coastal city being built in the world's fastest growing megacity, Lagos, standing on 10 million square meters of land reclaimed from the ocean. The development is protected by an eight and a half kilometer long seawall. This project represents a unique opportunity 
for investors to capitalize on overwhelming demand. Aside, let me touch upon the telecoms industry and the African growth story again here. Um, the mobile lines which we discussed earlier has grown from 32.3 million lines in 2006 to 141 million lines in 2017. That's a, that represents a 339% growth with 94.8 million internet subscribers via mobile devices. Mobile data and pay TV have been projected to grow at CAGRS of 16% and 5.2% respectively up to 2019 to reach $3.8 billion and $647 million. Netflix and iFlix recently extended services to Nigeria. Notably, broadband uptake leaves room for growth at 21% penetration. Aside from these, permit me to also highlight two other sectors with investment opportunities. Agriculture. We've just heard our Minister speak about the agricultural opportunities. So as the government strives for food self-sustainability, the agricultural sector is projected to become one of the largest employers of labor and revenue source for Nigeria as agricultural output increases. Opportunities exist in increasing crop mix and optimizing crop yields, increasing commercial farmlands, storage, processing, and access to markets. Manufacturing. Nigeria's population represents potential for a large domestic consumer base. Indeed, one constant with Nigeria has been its internally generated demand. As the economy moves towards diversification and seeks to grow its exploration capacity, Nigeria could match the performance of nations such as Malaysia and Thailand to achieve output of about $144 billion by year 2030. Given the vast investment potentials available, as well as the inherent operating environment, it challenges and risks, how can you, as an investor, access the Nigerian investment opportunity? The Nigerian Stock Exchange as an investment platform, there are many ways that you can access the markets. You can come in, be a brave man, and just go in directly, buy your land, do your investments, or you can do what you call a foreign portfolio investments, that is accessing the markets through the stock exchange. So the Nigerian Stock Exchange as an investment platform. The NSC services the largest economy in Africa and is championing the development of Africa's financial markets. The exchange is an automated multi-asset listing and trading platform with probably the fastest matching engine in Africa. There are over 300 securities listed and traded on the bourse, which is home to major international and domestic companies such as Dangote, Lafarge, Guinness, and Nigerian breweries, amongst others. The exchange serves as a barometer of economic activity, despite non-representation of a few economic sectors. As a testament to the economic re recovery, the NSC equity market activity in 2017 skyrocketed from 2016 levels as market turnover increased by 121% to 1.27 trillion naira and the index returned 42.30% to become one of the top three performing markets globally. This superior market performance, driven by increased confidence in the domestic economy, has continued in 2018, with the NSC All Share Index already up 17.91% year to date, and currently the best performing market globally, based on indices tracked by Bloomberg. I think the exchange deserves a round of applause for that performance. Thank you. Invex investor mix on the bourse is diverse with domestic investment flows outweighing foreign portfolio investment flows, albeit marginally. Investment protection is, en is enforced with strong market intermediary governance systems and automated market surveillance leveraging NASDAQ smart technology, a zero tolerance regulatory framework 
central clearing and settlement, as well as two investor protection funds by the NSC and the APEX regulator, the Securities Exchange Commission. If you are brave enough and you want to access the Nigerian markets by way of direct investments, the current administration has demonstrated its commitment to promoting private investments and foreign investments. Several initiatives have been advanced under the government's ease of doing business drive, as well as incentives to encourage investments in key focus sectors. Nigeria remains a haven for foreign direct investment, constantly ra ranking as a top five FDI destination in Africa, even whilst in recession in 2016. Typical focus areas for private equity and other direct foreign investment inflows include, but are not limited to, agriculture, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, housing, financial services, and fast-moving consumer goods. Notably, there are a plethora of tax and other incentives for investors to leverage, particularly those seeking to invest in pioneer or key strategic sectors. The federal government of Nigeria has also been supportive of privatization of state-owned entities. The NSC, SEC, and other capital market participants are actively collaborating with the current administration to actualize its privatization and funding objectives. A few of the notable privatization efforts of the federal government include the $2.5 billion <coughs> unbundling of PHCN, what was formerly called, uh, famously called NEPA, into six GENCOs as generating companies and 11 DISCOs. DISCOs means distribution companies. Sale of 10 government owned IPB projects. $225 million privatization of the LMN petrochemicals complex to the Indorama Group. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, with the government's efforts to implement the structural reforms outlined in the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan, the Nigerian economy is on course to consolidate and exceed the economic gains of 2017 fiscal year. <clears throat> the need to develop the Nigerian economy undoubtedly offers lucrative potential returns for those looking to invest in various economic sectors. A few of the notable initiatives of the government in support of attracting these investments include foreign exchange reforms with the introduction of the in investors and exporters FX window. I'm not sure whether you all know what the IE window is all about. The IE window is basically taking money from the central bank, which was initially funding the market, and now it is in the hands of the private sector. So whenever you need dollars, it's available now because the market is funding, the private sector is funding it. And that has what has led to the improved repatriation of capital because it's no longer in the hands of the government. The, the IE window was introduced in April 2017 and has been effective in easing capital repatriation following over a year of FX liquidity challenges. In the nine months of operation in 2017, approximately $26 billion was traded on the window with the spread against the parallel market narrowed to a range of 360 to 365 because what we always the private sector is always harping on government is that the multiplicity of exchange rates is part of what is putting off investors when you bring in money at a certain rate you can't get it out at another rate it creates uh, confusion in the minds of investors and one principal thing that investors want is certainty they don't want to come in at 305 today and then they're exiting at 300. So the IE window has eased that burden on investors. Tax incentives, exemption from income tax on all bond interest for a period of 10 years, ending in 2021. Nigeria's double taxation avoidance treaties reduces the withholding tax payable on dividends and interest to 7.5% for investors from treaty nations. Now, I don't, most of you here wouldn't benefit from that investment because Nigeria doesn't have a double taxation treaty with the United States. So unfortunately, you won't benefit from that, um, from that uh, tax treaty. 
investor protection, the NEC compliance status codes were introduced to provide timely information on issuers posted listing compliance. So that keeps you updated with what the issuers are doing. If you go to the NSC portal, you will see all the issuers, all the statements um, monthly. So if there's any change in directors, if there's any increase in capital, any any corporate change, you will see it on the uh, portal. Direct cash settlement now allows trades settled directly into investors' bank accounts. Previously, if you bought shares, and we've had one or two nasty cases where one a number of uh, brokers misbehaved, uh, where they were given instructions to um, sell shares, and the proceeds of the sale would ordinarily go to the broker's account, and the broker would appropriate that money to the detriment of the investor. So the rules have now changed. Once you opt for direct cash settlement, once you instruct your broker, buy these shares for me, the proceeds of the sale settles immediately into your account. So whenever you're instructing your broker, you inform the broker, I'm opting for di direct cash settlement. So there's no diversion, there's no threat of diversion of the proceeds of the sale. Without a doubt, significant strides are being made towards improving the infrastructure and economic framework of the Nigerian state. As Nigerians in diaspora, we should seize the opportunity to collaborate with the government in key development areas, as these also offer us an opportunity to collectively grow the Nigerian economy to desired standards, whilst producing superior investment returns and wealth. Notably, foreign investors continue to actively seek out these opportunities in Nigeria and across the African continent. So, why not the sons and daughters of the soil? Those of you who may be interested in accessing investment opportunities in Nigeria from your bases here in the US may wish to consider doing so via portfolio investments in securities listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange. This can be achieved either individually through your broker or asset manager. And I know there are one or two brokers here. I see one there, Mr. Ayodele. Um, or by pooling resources into an investment fund that is professionally managed. The investment fund construct could also be applied to provide foreign direct investment access to unlisted assets while having the benefit of getting professional management. These can be single, or diversified sector themed funds, which could be unitized and listed to provide secondary market liquidity for investors and requisite funding stability to the underlying project. The key would be to have such a vehicle properly and professionally structured to deliver on your investment needs as well as to ensure compliance with relevant regulations. I'm well aware of the narrative that reverberates around doing business in Nigeria by the foreign media and uh, ironically from expatriates who themselves are thriving in Nigeria about the high risks associated with doing so. But I would like to leave you with a business principle and I'm sure Senator Bruce will appreciate this story uh, that multinationals and indeed Western foreign missions employed with their ambassadors and CEOs. And we'll leave you to co conclude whether it is worth the risk in directing your investable funds to Nigeria or not. With the number of multinationals that I have been on their boards, I'm very well aware that as a principle, they do not allow their CEOs to stay in Nigeria beyond two years. And even ambassadors, ambassadors do not have more than a two year term in Nigeria. And I've always wondered why, what was the business ethic behind that, it's not a rule, but it's just a general, um, general principle which they have. And I understand that when an expatriate, and time has shown, when they've stayed more than two years in Nigeria, 
they get so assimilated into the environment that, in fact, most of them do marry, those ones who are single, they do marry into, with Nigerian wives. And also, the ambassadors tend to have business, they carry on business beyond their postings. So there must be something that attracts these guys to stay, to want to stay. Even though there's a narrative, oh, Nigeria is risky, it's dangerous, they're armed robbers, they're this, they're that. The question is, why do you have to stay beyond the two years that was allocated to you? So there's something that keeps them going. And that's the question that I will leave to you, those of you who remain apprehensive, that those guys, why are they staying? In fact, four out of the five past U.S. ambassadors have married Nigerians and have started businesses in Nigeria and continue to do business in Nigeria. So we should ask ourselves that question. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've been able to persuade some of you, if not all, of the opportunities that are abound in Nigeria and trust that you'll be in a better position to make informed decisions as to the appropriate investments to, get, to make given your appetites and profile for risk taking. But I'd like to also leave you with this comment from the hip hop artists who are prone to rap. Scared money, don't make none. So I thank you most for your